Commission Foundation is Virginia's leading peer-to-peer -peer recovery community organization. So if you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, let us get you connected. Build your self-esteem and lead you to a solid foundation in your recovery. Check us out. Well, since I live in Georgia now, I'm going to say, hey, y'all. I can do that now because I don't, I don't live here anymore. I live in Atlanta, so I say y'all an awful lot now. So I'm Lori Dew, and I am a woman in long-term recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction. You can say hi, Lori. <laughs> And for me, that means that I haven't had a drink or a drug in 10 and a half years. And <laughs> believe me, if you knew the shit show that was me before, you would say, it's a miracle that she got sober and that she has stayed sober one day at a time. You know, we often hear people who refer to us they call us addicts. And I myself, in the 12-step program that I frequent, hear people call themselves alkies and junkies, and I myself have called myself a cokehead because that's what I was a long, long time ago. But I'm so much more than that now. And those of us who are in recovery are so much more than that label. Addict, I think, is an antiquated term. We are a lot more than that label, as I said a moment ago. Because this is a disease that affects us, but it doesn't define us. If we were all defined by things we had done in our past, that'd be a little scary, wouldn't it? Imagine just being defined for, for the worst day of your life, right? That would stink. So fortunately, we've created new lives for ourselves that allow us to create a new reality. And we're way more than just people who have struggled and been addicted to drugs and alcohol and whatever else. We're not moral failures, we're human beings. And when the American people realize that, more than they do now, then we can all unite in support of recovery because really that's what we've got to do in this country. We know that between 23 and 25 million Americans are struggling with addiction, but we only know of 2 million people who are seeking help. So why would 21 to 23 million people in this country choose to remain untreated and risk death. Why? Anybody want to take a guess? They don't, know. Can't get they don't know, they can't get treatment. Oh yeah, and there's that nasty little thing called stigma. And I think that stigma is just as dangerous as overdoses themselves. Anybody else agree with that? Yeah. Stigma can kill people? Yeah. Stigma, by definition, I'm going to read it to you, is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. So essentially, stigma is a bad reputation that's given to a group of people, like us, like people who have suffered with addiction, and even people who are in recovery. We face an awful lot of stigma, and you wouldn't think in this day and age with so much else going on that those of us who have decided to turn our lives around would face stigma, but we do. And I think that stigma originates from a place of fear because people don't understand it. They perhaps understand the implications of what addiction means rather than the disease itself. Well, addicts are, are violent and they're dangerous and they're stupid and lazy and it's their fault. So that people tend to understand. But rather than looking at the logistics that surround the disorder, they instead focus on the evidence that consists of the crimes that are committed by people suffering from addiction, by the outbursts you might see in public 
or somebody shooting up on the street. Joe and I saw um, some people using, was it methadone on the way over? Drinking methadone on the way over here. Um, and the physical appearance of addicts, that's what a lot of people look at. And people historically fear what they don't understand. That's why I think it's up to us to help people understand what this disease is about. Stigma has no place in recovery at all. Come on in. Come on in. You're a little late, but you're still going to get some good messages here. We're talking about stigma and how it has no place. And I'm not shaming you, I promise. And you know, shame and blame is all part of it. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard this all before. People, there's all this talk about stigma. Well, I'm talking about it because I just got up here. How is that five minutes? Okay. All right, I'm gonna have to go super fast. Um, okay. So stigma is one of the reasons why I decided to go public six years, and I, six years ago. And I did so. Um, because my anonymity was broken on the internet, which was awesome. But rather than burying my head in the sand, I decided to go public. And literally after my story was revealed on the internet, I went on the Today Show the next day, I went on CNN, I did all the talk show circuit that day and the day after, and then I became an advocate. And here we are today. As Honesty said, we've got to share our stories. So that's why I talk about how, in the height of my addiction, I would lie on the floor of my office at CNN or Fox News Channel, or whatever network, wherever I was anchoring. I couldn't move. Somehow I would stand up, make it down to the studio, and say, God, if you get me through this show, I'll never drink again. Does that sound familiar? I'll never do it again. And of course, as soon as I got through the show, fooled everybody again. I went out and got drunk to celebrate. That's why I talk about being high on booze and cocaine when I met President Bush. That's why I talk about my overdose and how I came to in the emergency room of Roosevelt Hospital here in New York City and how I drank two days later after overdosing and how I didn't get sober for two and a half years after overdosing. This is why we are all out doing what we're doing, because addiction is no different from AIDS or breast cancer. Right? Right. And in, with those diseases, silence equals death. Silence equals death was the main slogan during the early days of the AIDS epidemic. Silence kills people. Imagine if everybody stayed silent about breast cancer, and like Betty Ford didn't come out and announce that not only was she an alcoholic, she also had breast cancer. Imagine where we would be now. Probably not here. In 2015, heroin deaths surpassed deadly car crashes and gun homicides. 33,000 people died of opioid overdose, 20,000 from other drugs, and 88,000 a year from alcoholism. You add all that up and you get 141,000 people a year dying of this disease. That's 386 people a day. And you know what 386 people a day is? That's 757 falling out of the sky. Imagine if a literal 757 fell out of the sky every day. You think it would get national attention? Yeah. Yes, it would. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And you think, <laughs> if, it, you think if 386 people died every day of breast cancer, don't you think that would get a lot of attention? We are no different. So silence doesn't help. That's why I'm here, and that's why you're here, because I want to show that this is the face of addiction. People look at me and they say, there's no way. You're an addict? You were, you were an addict? Yes, I was. And you know what? I will be a person in long-term recovery from this disease. I'll never get over it. I'm always going to have this with me. This is the face of addiction, and this is the face of recovery. And that's why we're out, and we're proud, and we're talking about it. Here's what I get a lot of. You really don't look like an alcoholic. You're so pretty, and didn't you go to private school? Yes, I did, and I went to debutante parties, and I was in a sorority, and I was an NCAA athlete, and 
a national TV news anchor, it doesn't care. The disease doesn't care who I am. The other thing I got a lot of because of stigma was I had a, a former colleague of mine uh, from Fox News Channel. I like to say uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic and a recovering Fox News anchor. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> but I had a colleague who would see me at parties or out at events and she'd say, Lori. Lori, yes? She said, how are you? I said, I'm great. She said, you know, the alcoholism. And I was like, yeah, yeah I know what you're talking about. Um, I'm great, man. I'm doing great. I'm six years sober, or eight years sober, or 10 years, you know, whatever it was. I'm living in recovery. Then there was the time that I went on a date fairly early in recovery and the guy didn't know that I was in recovery till we were on our hot dates and we were at dinner and he goes to order a drink and I didn't order anything and he goes, uh, you don't drink? And I said, I don't. And he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> and I go, sorry? And he goes, oh. literally, he said, how am I supposed to get lucky tonight? <laughs> and inside I was thinking, well, now you're definitely not getting lucky. <laughs> But you know, that's what we get. <laughs> that's what we get. So I, we know that addiction is not a spectator sport. We know that eventually it affects everybody, right? It affects the family, the friends, the colleagues, the tentacles are far and wide, which is why it's so important to speak in the open. You know, three days ago or four days ago, uh, there are a couple of other people in this room and I were all fortunate enough to be at the White House speaking about medication-assisted treatment on behalf of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the ONDCP. And boy, what, what a thrill to be in the White House and not shoved in a church basement somewhere, but to be in a beautiful room full of light talking about policy whether or not some of this stuff is ever going to be enacted is another topic for another day. If we could just get the president to declare that state of emergency, whole separate topic. Felt good to be there. And again, that kind of thing chips away at the stigma. The other area where I think it is tough for people is in the workplace. I can tell you that when I was an anchor at CNN and Fox, it never occurred to me to go to HR to tell them about my nasty little cocaine problem because I figured they'd fire me. They actually couldn't fire me for that. Here's a statistic that may, may be interesting to you. According to the National Behavior Consortium, that's an organization, only 3.5% of employees take advantage of EAPs, employee assistance programs. Why? Stigma. People don't want to raise their hand at work and say, I need help because they're scared they're gonna lose their jobs. But the truth of the matter is that addiction costs employers in this country $104 billion a year. That's a ton of money. So what we all need to do, and I truly wish I could take the video, and you know what, maybe I will take the video from tonight and send it to some insurance companies and send it to some major workplaces in my hometown of Atlanta, like Coca-Cola, like Chick-fil-A, like CNN, like Delta Airlines, and say, watch this, because your companies are losing billions and billions of year, dollars a year because of addiction. Get rid of the stigma. Treat your employees with care. Ask them how they're doing. Make sure they get the help they need. And when they come back from getting the help they need, make sure that they get the support they need too. Because I can tell you, we are pretty productive employees once we, you know, get sober. Yeah. The last thing I'll say, and I know I've gone way over with my time, I am very proud to be a part of a new documentary that is being released in Albany, New York tomorrow night. It's a documentary called Reversing the Stigma, 
that Governor Cuomo's office reached out to me 18 months ago and asked me to be the face and voice of the documentary. I was so proud to accept, and there has been a team at work who's been preparing this documentary, and it is launching tomorrow night. And you can check it out online. It's Reversing the Stigma. It's going to be airing on local PBS stations around New York State. And hopefully, we're going to try to find a national audience for this thing. Because just as Greg Williams broke ground with the anonymous people and with other documentaries that we have seen, stigma is a really important part of all this. So I'm happy that this documentary is being shown tomorrow night in Albany, will be shown around the state, and will hopefully find a national audience. You know, I keep hearing, and I promise I'm wrapping it up right now, John, so don't worry. I keep hearing, this is our time. No, this is really our time in recovery. I heard that five years ago. I heard it three years ago. I heard it two years ago. I heard it a year ago. I'm hearing it tonight. Let's really make it our time. Let's get out there and kick some ass, shall we? Thank you very much. <laughs>